Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? Well, good morning. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Man, such an amazing presence of the Lord here. If you have your Bibles, take them out. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Man, I'm thankful for a church that gives and partners with Convoy of Hope. Uh, I'm thankful for you guys' partnership and investing in that. And how many believe compassion is the heart of our Lord? And so, man, they go out and they win people for Jesus, and we get to do that with them. Hey, just one quick announcement before we dive into the Word. Uh, some of you may know our Goose Creek campus pastor, our previous Goose Creek campus pastor, Pastor Tyler and Holly Still. Uh, they resigned uh, spring of last year to plant a church in the upstate near Spartanburg, and uh, we are so excited for them. Today is their launch Sunday. So as we're meeting here, how many believe in God's gonna use them to do amazing things in the upstate, and we are so proud of them. Send them an encouraging text, an encouraging word, and uh, we're believing God for God to do good things through them in the upstate, amen? Hey, we're in this series, Sex, Lies, and Truth. If you're a guest with us, we welcome. We don't talk about sex every week. We're just, we're just focused in this, this, uh, this month. But this series, we believe, is important. It's important not just for you to learn and, and to be equipped, but it's important because where we find our counseling at, where we find our culture at when it comes to this topic of sex and relationships and marriage. How I many know the enemy is at war? And he wants to divide in this topic. He wants to pervert God's design. And so we've been diving into this over the past couple of weeks. And today, this morning, we're going to talk about marriage. Uh, I will tell you, I'm a little more PG. I gave the PG-13 ones away to, to, the, to the other guys. And uh, so we're going to dive in. And we're going to look at biblical marriage based out of Ephesians chapter 5. So stand with me for the reading of God's word. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to pick up at verse 22. While you're standing, I will say, if you're single in here or single again, still take notes. Note takers are difference makers. Still take notes. Uh, because I believe you can apply this to your relationships now and even your future relationships. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourself to your own husband as you do to the Lord. For husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, for which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands. Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but as holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one hated their own body. They feed it, care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Father, today, I pray as we look at your word, Lord, we, we're so thankful for the beautiful picture of, of your cross and salvation and what that meant, and God, we're so thankful that Paul kind of encapsulates, Lord, what a husband and wife relationship should look like. So God, as I pray, as we dive into this word, Lord, your word would produce transformation in us and through us, and we would leave here forever changed. We love you, Jesus, in your name we pray, amen, amen. As you see, to tell your neighbor they look good. Again, this morning we're gonna get really practical because I do believe marriages are under attack. And so we wanna give you a practical guide for healthy marriage. 
I believe it's going to help you. But how many know a guide is only worth it if we put it into practice? All right, so we're going to challenge you to take notes, challenge you that this is not just going to be a Tuesday or a Monday thing, but this is something that you're going to have to adhere to over and over again. Uh, again, take your notes, follow along with us on the Version app. Number one, healthy marriages. Healthy marriages work. Healthy marriages work. Look at this phrase. Wives, submit yourself. Husbands, love. Give up yourself. Love as you love your Self. Paul in this passage, again, the beautiful picture of what Christ did, but he's making this move in this picture because all of these things are contrary to you and I's nature. It is not normal for us to live in sacrifice. It's not normal for us to put others above ourselves. We live in a selfish nature. And so he's saying, This command is, why? Because these things are difficult. These things are not comfortable. And bigger than that, these things take work. They take work. I have an eight-year-old daughter. Uh, Her name is Ray. And uh, the twins are now 17. Uh, Jack is uh, 15. And then we're we're at ground zero with Ray. We're, we're We're at eight. And so it, it's a new dynamic. It's also a girl for me, and it's, it's different. I mean, girl, girls are a little different. Dads in here? Any girl dads? They're a little bit different. Um, and Ray, at the age of eight, um, she, she gets her own money, and she calls them monies. I have my monies. And she gets her own money, and she's getting this concept, and it's kind of hard for her to grasp, but she'll have a birthday, or she'll do some chores, or she'll find some change in the couch cushions and on the dryer and those kind of things. And she'll, she'll gather all this and she'll say, Dad, it's time for me to go get a toy. It's time for me to go spend the money. And that normally entails me and her going to the store, going down the toy aisle. It also in, in, includes some uh, Jesus chicken and some, some milkshakes at Chick-fil-A. It, it includes some of that as a daddy-daughter date. And we, we go. And, and when we get to the toy aisle, she's, she's pretty intentional, but at the same time, I still have a little bit of Larry Burbacher in my roots that I'm cheap and I'm frugal. I'm like, hey, babe, you only have $17.53. So let's keep that, let's keep that on the forefront, $17.53. And of course, she goes and she's looking just aisle. Let's try this aisle. Let's try this aisle. And she's picking out like things that the most expensive thing on the aisle, like every single aisle. Like, what about this? I said, well, that's $450. I don't even have that money right now. And, and, and you have $17. You're going to be a little short. You're going to be a little short on the life-size pony um, that, that is at the... Why do they put the pony at the end cap? Why, why do they do that? The one that talks to you that you can sit on? Um, you don't have to feed it, I guess, and it doesn't poop. So there's, there's winds to it. But well, why? So you can't buy it. So we go through this thing. You don't have the money for that. And she'll make this statement just kind of flipping sometimes. Well, Dad, just use your card. <laughs> I know that's what her mom does. Like maybe she picks up that pattern. Just she's at home sick watching online with, with the kids so I can say that. Just your card. It's the magic wand that just kind of gets you stuff. And, and there's this children think or have this childish mindset that things should just work out without me having to work for them, right? And, uh, but how many of you know, as you get older, you start to learn how life really works? Anybody know how life really works? Is that you, that debit card only works when you what? When you put money in, in the bank account. And to ha- have the money in the bank account, you have to work, have a J-O-B, have, have a job. And then how many know when that money gets in the account, it's not like, now let's go to the toy store. It's like, you got, you got to pay for some stuff. I, Uncle Sam gets some, golly, he gets, and it seems like he's getting more than he used to. Uncle Sam gets some, right? My insurance, the retirement, the things. And then you can't just buy the things that you want because there's also other things in line, in the, in, in the bill line. Now you could, you could, you could do it on credit, right? And if you do that often, we are offering financial peace with Dave Ramsey here. I think it's on Friday nights that you may want to jump into. You could, because if you do it on credit, what does that mean? You're still going to have to 
pay it back, but probably more than what, than what you started from. And then, that, but there's this concept as a kid, you're like, yeah, I don't care, can I just get all the toys and a pony? Can I just get all, all the things that I want? You see, a lot of us, I need you to get this, have a hard time growing out of that. Which I think is, is why we get stuck, because we don't think long term because we really want the pony right now. We really want the stuff right now. And here's the fact, if, if you ignore the way things really work, like you can't get away from that, because you don't wanna to have to put the work in, you're eventually going to have to face the consequences for the realities that you ignore. This statement, navigating an adult world or, or adult relationships with a child, a childish mindset will always end in disappointment. First Corinthians chapter 13, is the love chapter, and, and Paul dives into this chapter, and it's a beautiful chapter, and there's a ton of theolo theology behind it, and it can go a, a ton of different ways, but verse 11 kind of just stands out. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I talked, I thought like a child. I, I did more than thought, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away the childish Things. Again, there's a lot of categories that this chapter speaks to, but it's notable inside and outside of the passage that this whole chapter is built on what sacrificial love is in the model of Christ and what an intentional relationship needs to look, look like. And you're getting this view over and over again of the love of Christ. And so he says, and kind of, you got to get this order. He says, look, all this stuff that I try to attempt, wisdom, fine things that I try to attempt in the first couple of verses, it's all a clanging symbol. It doesn't make sense. I pursued all of this. And without love in proper perspective, it's empty. And so then he says in verse four, love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor. It's not self-seeking. I think, think about marriage relationships. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. And so Paul is saying, listen, you're chasing this love, you're chasing this emotional response, you're chasing this self-serving childish thing. And I will tell you, it's not real. It won't remain, and I'm challenging you from, from experience, put away the childish stuff. Work towards patience, work towards kindness, work towards not being proud or self-seeking. I work toward the love that's not angered, the love that doesn't keep records of wrongs, so I put away this childish stuff. You see, there's a certain feeling that we're chasing, and I, th I think it kind of goes all the way back to maybe your first romances of when you were a, a, a teenager. Come on, how many remember uh, teenage love? How many remember your first dating experiences? Four of you remember that. <laughs> you remember that, that, that thing that you did that, that makes you feel nervous and, and, and you're going out on a date and you're like, why am I sweaty? I'm sweating profusely. I, I, I'm breathing, it becomes shallow. This, this date, I'm, I'm anxious about it. You overthink about what you're wearing and you're looking in the mirror and you're like, and you, you're, you're doing this marriage check on what, on what you're wearing, why? Because you're going out on this date and there's this sense of excitement and anticipation that anything, that anything can happen. Um, despite what you may believe, I didn't have a lot of dating experience before I met my wife. I know that shocks you. Um, our first date, I, I mean, I, I rolled out the red carpet. We went to Applebee's <laughs> on a date night. I, was, I made it before the rap. I was, that's what they were singing about. Went to Applebee's. And I remember, I remember kind of the feeling like, I don't know what to do. I, do, I, do I do the chair thing? You know, like we're coming down to the table, or is that misogynistic, or is that a good thing? Is that chivalrous? You know, you, you start to question, you start to question everything. Like, you sit down, you start talking, and I'm like, do I ever go pee, because I got to? Like, you're all these things, like, do I get up, is that rude? I don't know what to say. Tell me about your 
your life and you're starting trying to start conversations and you're, you're trying, trying to do this stuff and then you realize that the riblet and chicken finger basket was a bad idea because it's messy and they're like, I shouldn't have got the ribs. This was stupid. And you got barbecue sauce in your fingernails. She's not going to want to hold your hand later. All these things are going on, are going on in your head. And, and you, you come out of that date. Should we, should we go on a walk afterwards? Should I try to hold the hand? Should we do those things? You come out of that date. And I've never felt like this before. And I feel alive. And I think I'm falling in love. Date one. Was anybody else done on date one? Anybody? Nobody? I can't see very well. Date one. Yeah, that was my ex-girlfriend. I'm just kidding. We say this, there's this childlike thing about it where our brain is mush, we have these tingles in our body. I needed to get this romantic love that can be broken down into two main categories, attraction and attachment. We've talked about this each week in our series, but just a reminder, the feeling of attraction is, or or the feeling of something new, or that, that thing that goes off in your brain is that dopamine buzz. And that dopamine gets us interested in each other, but watch this, it responds only to things that are new or extra exciting. It responds to the possible rather than the real. Now the problem is that once you're in a relationship, that childish stuff, or in other words, the dopamine and the excitement, how do you know, it can eventually fade and eventually stop. And that's why so many times passionate love starts to fade. The the thrilling of mystery and the unknown becomes boring and familiar and mundane and everyday. And so here's the thing. If you're going to stay attached, you have to find a reason beyond the dopamine thrill of the new. Because you'll end up constantly chasing something or looking for something new. If you talk to those people who bounce from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship, they've never, they don't wanna put in the work. They don't, they're not thinking long-term. They, they just enjoy the chase. They just enjoy the dopamine hit. You see, finding a person is tough, but how I many know learning to live with them is even tougher? How I many know that takes work? takes work. Paul would say it it takes patience and that takes work. It takes dying to yourself and that takes work. It takes not envying and that takes work. It takes not easily getting angered and how many know that takes work. I want to give you this morning real real, something real practical and and I need you to write this down. There are four D's that will help you that I I want you to commit to working and and, and I, I've labeled this just section, and this is kind of the bonus, this is the extra section. I've labeled this section, be friends with benefits. I'm talking about marriage, okay? Let me clarify. I'm talking about, talking about marriage. Be friends with benefits. This will help you move beyond the dopamine hit. So there's three Ds. Number one, the first thing you need to do, and we take our staff through this in, in our staff health. Number one, you need to dialogue daily. Dialogue daily. Again, this is really practical. Dialogue daily. Make the commitment. It, it takes work, but you need daily debriefs with your spouse. I mean, oh, life is busy. Things are stressful. Things are, things are going on. And so you need time to let things off. You need time to talk. You need time to communicate. You need time to connect. And I will say, as you dialogue daily, I will say it is great to vent. It is great to share. How many thankfully that you can vent to your partner? But also you need to share some blessings. You need to share why you're thankful. You need to share some good things that the Lord did for you that day. And you need to, sometimes my wife and I, okay, tell me three good things. Because we just did that. Tell me three good things. And and you start those things. What this does, it, it creates connection beyond the physical. Talking actually creates bonds and it bonds you together. It informs you what's happening. Can I encourage the men, can you initiate this? When you walk in the door, when the things are crazy, when you've been gone all day, when all these things, you've both been on separate, separate moves, come together, take initiative. What does that look like? Get off your phone. That was extra. Put it down. I know you have 17 emails from the day that you didn't get while you were driving, but get off, get off the phone, put it down, turn off the Netflix. It's so easy, I'm guilty of this, to getting in the pattern of just vegging. 
I walk in the door and I need my stretchy pants just to stop. I don't want to do anything. Dialogue daily. Take, take the work to do that. Number two, date weekly. Date weekly. This takes work. I'm seeing some elbows from some spouses. This takes work. This takes planning. This takes calendar and scheduling. But how many know there's something about getting out of the house? We had the excuse we were kind of in, a, in the rut for a season. Just like we like our house. Let's just be home tonight. Let's just be home tonight. Let's just, and then we're home eight eight nights of the week. But there's something about taking the initiative. There's something about getting out. I will tell you just as a bonus, it doesn't always have to be expensive, but it needs to be intentional. It needs to be intentional. I know on that date, I'm gonna challenge you again. Put the phones down. Put them down. Don't necessarily talk about the chores and the list and the stuff. The date is more than a debrief. It's where you get to dream and talk about the things and the blessings and the hope. Come on, you, again, you remember when you first started dating? Nobody. God. <laughs> and you held the door? Come on, you, you cared about your outfit? Men, you, you didn't wear flip-flops on every occasion? You didn't put a hat on all the time? You got in, you, you, you dressed up? Got, got rid of the yoga pants. We, we went out. We did some things. We held the door. We, all of that, all of that stuff. What if you started with flowers? Oh, my goodness. Be intentional. Be intentional. Number three, to part quarterly. I talked about this back in the spring on Sabbath. But to part quarterly. This takes work. This takes planning. We have a philosophy, and I get it from my dad. We have this philosophy that we will work hard, but we will also play and rest hard. We will work hard. How many know if you, if you have that trip to look forward to, man, it's exciting. You're like, man, if three weeks, we're going on the cruise. In three weeks, we're going here. Three weeks, we can do this. In three weeks. I will say depart, departing takes work and planning. And if you can, I'm going to give you the King James version of depart. Thy kids, kids shall not go. Don't take them. I just love them so much. I know. But you need to make your marriage a priority. And it's important. It's important that you're refreshed and revived and renewed. Again, it doesn't have to be crazy expensive. It doesn't have to be crazy extravagant. But get away quarterly. I will tell you, this changed my marriage. Because what was so frustrating, I found when I got alone and departed with my wife, actually became a joy and a victory and a, and a life-giving thing. I will tell you, depart is important. Any mountain people? Okay, you go to the mountains and you just see and the hike and the waterfalls and the thing. Any beach people? You go out to the beach, you hear the ocean, you hear the way. You can be at the beach in the winter and it's just relaxing and things, and things are happening. And you go and you do that. I will tell you, save, invest, and put energy into this because the anticipation is good. The food is good, amen? Come on, you go out to a restaurant, the sex is good, amen? It's PG. I see that hand in the back. See, here's the catch. Many times there's the cares and the heaviness and the monotony, and they're all tied together. And when we get away to those mountains and the beach, we're able, let's put the cell phone on, do not disturb, put the email response. Pastor Jason is out of the office and will not answer back, I promise, because I'm away. I'm getting refueled. I'm enjoying awe and wonder and beauty, and it refuels you. Get away. Number four. I'm going to give you the PG version, but number four is the fourth D. Do it. We talked about this in week one, and if you missed that, go back and watch that. And again, I paid somebody to talk about that topic for you. <laughs> Do it. I'll put an equal sign a lot after that. I'm not gonna tell you the frequency <laughs> or give you the number, but I will tell you what we heard in week one, the enemy doesn't want you to have a good sexual relationship with your spouse. The enemy is attacking here. So you need to know that this takes work. It needs to be intentional. You may, and I know this may not be romantic, but you may even need to schedule it. Schedule it. 
Schedule it, because this is where the enemy is going to come. And how many know there's something about the chemicals, the bonding, that time, that oneness? How many thankful that God established is so, so important, and it takes work on both sides? Amen? Takes work. Four Ds. Who's ready to commit? Not just the fourth one, guys. (laughs) Not just the fourth one. All all of them. (laughs) All of them. All right. It takes work. Here's the challenge. Be friends with benefits. Amen? Be friends. Be friends with benefits. Healthy marriages take work. Number two, healthy marriages give. Now, our main text in Ephesians 5, it says, wives, submit to your husbands. And then it says, husbands, lay down your wife, life or give your life up. And what I believe is Paul is reinstating the proper order that was lost in the garden. If you remember the fall, uh, Eve oversteps her passive husband and actually takes the fruit and original sin is introduced. On the way out of the garden, God gives what seems to be some harsh consequences of the fall. The ground is cursed, the thorns and the sistles and the sweat and the toils. But then he, he puts things back into order with Eve as he makes the command. He said, listen, childbearing is gonna be difficult. I'm thankful I don't know that experience, but I hear it's pretty rough. <laughs> Childbearing is going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. There'll be, there'll be pain in that. And then the second half of verse 16, it says, your desire will again be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, Ephesians, again, he's putting these things in back in order. He's reinstating God's design in the command of Genesis chapter three, but he's actually giving it a little more context and a little more fulfillment. You got to get this because A lot of people will read Genesis 3 and read Ephesians 5, and they will read it from a selfish mindset that says, I'm going to get what I'm going to get out of this. Oh, you better submit. You better respect. Well, you better die. And we have these, (laughs) we have this tension that happens. But you got to get what he's exposing. What he's exposing is that we're created different. You need to hear this. And we have different roles. We're created different, and we have different roles. You see what you'll find after being married for some time, we start to live in this tension of Genesis where we struggle for the power and the control. And again, a lot of times going after it in different ways. Men and women are created different with different roles. So as the power and the authority, as as there starts to get a struggle and then you throw in rhythms of life and busyness and then you throw in what was modeled by our parents or the previous generation and now we come together in this union and it's difficult. It's difficult, why? Because men and women have different roles and they're, they're different. When it comes to power or authority or lobbying for that, there's this mode in men that we either power up and we completely take control or we power down and relinquish all control. I will tell you both of those create fear for the spouse, for the woman, of not being loved, which that's her greatest fear. Women, we use this form of manipulation and charm and flirting, or we tear down by questioning the ability of the man. What does that do? Creates the feeling that he's not enough, which is the man's biggest fear. And so we have this tension when it comes to power and that struggle. What I often get asked about the verse in Genesis in Ephesians chapter five and in that marriage couple counseling and you go through this loving and this compromise and what it's supposed to be. And they're like, I get it, pastor, but I have one question. Who gets the final say? Come on, you've been there. Like who, who, who has the final authority? I mean, I know we're supposed to compromise. You just told us all that stuff. I know we're supposed to final ground find common ground, but but when we can't, who gets to assert their will? In other words, who has permission from the Bible to put their foot down and demand what they want when it comes to authority in a marriage? Paul gives you the answer, you ready? Here it is. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Each one of you should love, love, wife, respect. The answer, wives, submit and respect. Husband, love, lay down your rights and serve, and maybe you're in that counseling moment and you're thinking, that's not the answer I was looking for. I thought you were gonna tell me, it's always me, I'm always right. The Bible, here's the catch, isn't interested in pitting you against each other, isn't interested in giving you ammo for one another, and by the way, 
If that's your position, you're missing the point of Ephesians chapter five, you're missing Corinthians 13. What's he saying? Men, your natural tendency is to have pride and ego and crave authority. Some of you, you don't show emotion, you struggle with vulnerability. So what does he say? He, he exposes this. Take the position of Christ. I command you, you need to be humble, you need to serve. Men, do what's most loving to her, which is lay down your life for her. Women, do what communicates the most. He said respect, that last line in verse 33. Respect, you know he craves honor. It's, it's how he was wired, it's how he was designed. So submit to him, respect him, honor him. Let him make a decision. I don't know, maybe. That was funny, you're in first service. Each, look, if each one of you are looking out for the other, the whole thing gets better. And there's this thing that starts to happen. Part of the disconnect for us is scripture isn't concerned with helping you get what you want as much as it is challenging you to give all you can, to be a giver, which leads us to our next theme. Healthy marriages work, healthy marriages give, and this is the action point. Healthy marriages serve. After you surrender kind of this will mode, there, there's an action that has to follow. I will say this in almost every marriage counseling appointment that I am, when I refer to Ephesians chapter five, I will say this. Look at me, man. It's really easy for your wife to follow you if you die for her. It's really easy for your wife to submit to you and to come under your authority if you serve her as Christ loved the church, if you give yourself up for her, right? Isn't that the case? Have you ever had a boss who is kind of a jerk? Who is certain, oh yeah. My staff better not raise their hand. <laughs> ever had a boss, he's kind of a jerk, he asserts authority, goes after title, goes after things, hey, this is who I am, you just do, but then have you ever had a boss who just serves you and you'll follow that guy off a cliff? You'll just, uh, he's, he's the man, he's humble, he's this. He, there's, that, there's that mode that everybody wants to follow a servant. Come on, women, the most sexy thing for that man to do is to serve you, is to lay down his life for you, is to give himself up for you. I need you to get this statement. Love intentionally prioritizes them instead of impulsively preferring me. I want, you to, I want you to give a, the way, I, I wanna give you some ways to put this into actions because just, just really quickly, there's four or five things in here that will make this kinda, kinda, kinda hit home. And, and jot these down. How do we do this? How do we, how do we love and how do we prefer? The first thing we need to do is see more than yourself. This is Ephesians 5. This is what Paul says. Hey, I know this is, counter to how your flesh works, but I need you to give your life up. So, so see more than self. In other words, see beyond your immediate needs and feelings. Anybody ever, we, we've got photos going all the time now because of, of cell phones and phones and those kind of things. Anybody be in a, in a group photo, right? I can't see very well because of the lights. What's the first thing you do when you see that group photo? You look at yourself. You're only concerned with the way your shirt looks, the way your smile looks, the way your teeth looks, the way your hair looks. It, is my back fat showing? I mean, you're looking at all these things in the picture, right? And you'll, and you'll be like, I look good. And my wife's like, my face looks disfigured. Uh, I think this one's a keeper. This is, this is mantle worthy right here. I am sexy. And that's all anybody else is gonna look at anyways, right? We look, we look, for, we look at our, ourselves. So in other words, the way we feel about the entire picture is based on how we look. And I, I think we not only do that with pictures, but we do that with a lot of things in life. We do that with our, our relationships. And sometimes when I realize I, I respond to something poorly, uh, that's a nice way of saying it, I'll say this line like, sorry, I was, I was in my head a little too much. What I mean is, I'm thinking so much about what I was feeling and wanting, I really wasn't thinking about anybody else in the room. 
I need you to get this. Love makes decisions based on what's good for us, not based on what's good for just me. So I've got to, I've got to make the intentionality to see more than myself. The next thing, do more than you want. Now, now this is moving into that act. Act beyond your immediate needs and feelings. We're going to dive into that. There's a myth in our culture that says, just do what you love and you'll always love your life. And so you talk to some people, they're like, that's why I'm holding out for a full-time gig doing this. And when I get the full-time job doing this, and that's when I'm going to be fulfilled. And so they wait instead of taking the job being offered. Meanwhile, in that season, they're bored, purposeless, and drowning in debt. It, it doesn't make, it, I'm just going to wait and hold out. Why? Because what is right doesn't always feel right when it comes down to it. So if I'm basing everything on feelings, how many know I'm going I'm 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 to be broken and empty? Because I can't, I can't trust my feelings, especially in crisis, especially in struggles, especially in trials. Like when you're going through a hard time, you're the last person who should trust your feelings. Like that's, that doesn't work. In fact, no, no, one, no one wants to go to work every day, no matter how much they love their job. Because eventually work implies I'm doing something, I'm toiling, I'm pushing. Some of you are like, that's not true. You would rather be in PJs, at least for a couple days. You don't wanna to go to work every day. Same thing, no one, wants, no one who wants to build a great marriage, how many know, feels head over heels every day of their life. And so you need to understand this, love is not a feeling, it's a decision. It's a decision. A lot of us do our, this is just extra, a lot of us do that with our relationship with the Lord. I don't feel God. I, I, man, when I was in youth camp, I felt him at the altar, and now I just don't feel him as an adult. But I make the commitment to read his word and study his love letter and know that I've seen him in the sanctuary and beheld his glory and his love is better than life, so I will sing, I will praise, I will. So there's a decision behind, behind our serving and what we do. That wasn't in my notes. Matthew chapter five gives us this advice, and I know there's a lot of Roman context in here, but just for our sake, he says, when someone hits you in the face, what do you do? You, you, turn, you turn the other cheek. When someone asks you to go a mile, you go the extra one, you go two. When someone asks for the, sh for the shirt off your back, you give them your your Levi's denim jacket as well. Just you, you give that to them. It's almost jacket season. Praise God. Come on, somebody. Each of these scenarios is about doing more than what we want. Why? Because I don't even want to go the first mile, much less the second mile, but there's a commitment because I want relationship and I'm about that relationship. Next thing, give more than you have. I mean, oh, there's more, I believe there's more in us than a lot of us think. Anybody ever worked out with a trainer? You will be sore for the next five days. It's ridiculously, it's ridiculously what they do. The object of the trainer is they learn your limits and then they incrementally push you past them. And that causes growth because they understand when you think you've got nothing left, there's always a little bit more. Have I ever, I was doing some weightlifting with the kids and stuff and you're, you're doing that bench press and they're like, all right, this is the eight, you're gonna get eight on this rep. And so you're like, you're like, seven. I'm like, come on, one more. Eight. And then you got that trainer behind you. Hey, let's do two more. You got it. Like, I thought we were going to eight. And I'm like, no, you got two more. All right, one. Uh, and then two. All right, one more. No, you said, you said two more. Now you're going three. And they, they push you. And what? They're right there coaching you. They're right there helping. You. They're pushing you beyond to give a little bit more. Here's the catch. In the Christian life, the Bible designed this, giving is how you grow. Giving is how you grow. If you wanna grow in an area, what does the Bible say? You sow in the area, you reap what you sow. Some of you, you want friends? You gotta be friendly. You want peace? Start being a peacemaker, not a complainer. You wanna you want be blessed financially? 
Give generously. You want to be loved? Love unconditionally. You want to be more respectful? Be faithful in the little things. You want more joy? Focus on the positives of life and stop complaining. You want to be listened to? Listen to others. You want health? Take care of your body and put down the cheeseburger. You want to eat your own french fries? Don't get married. <laughs> like, here's the thing. If you want to grow in an area, you got to sow in the area. You got to sow in the area. So what does that mean? I've got to give more than what I have. I've got to push beyond. I've got to do things that I may not want to do or feel like doing. And then, and then the last one is love more than you feel. You put love into action. You don't need emotions to drive you. Uh, when, when you were single, many of you don't even remember that time, but when you were single, you made most of your own decisions. But as you choose covenant relationship, as you choose to partner with someone in marriage, you commit to give them a significant say across everything. Some of you have separate checking accounts. I don't think you should. We are married, we are one. Everything is mine, everything is yours. We come, we come together. You have say in what we do. We have say together as a family. We live together as one. Where we go, what we think, what paint color we're gonna pick, where we go for our Tuesday night date night, if I'm gonna wear yoga pants or flip flops, we're gonna talk about it. Are we gonna buy the new iPhone? I don't know, let's talk about it before we make the, our, why is Amazon at our house? We're gonna talk about those decisions. So we commit to share, we commit to love like this. Listen, marriage means sharing, watch this, and sharing means giving up complete control. It means giving up you want for the sake of someone else. Love, it includes feelings that are important, but it goes beyond them. It means I now continually choose to act in love even when I don't feel love. I'm thankful for Jesus who loved literally unto death, loved you and I, pursued you and I. I'm thankful that he sacrificed even when it hurt and he bore on his body the mark of selflessness. I would say just in reference to that and what Ephesians chapter five is, love will usually leave a mark because there's sacrifice in that. It's more than what you feel. There are some things that you together as a married couple decided against. You laid down some things in your own personal pursuit. You had opportunities that you set aside. You had potential that you chose not to follow through on or not to be fulfilled. You had dreams that you demoted or pushed back. All proof of love. I bet most of them don't feel good at the time. Now I will say, just as a side note, there are times you need to draw boundaries and establish boundaries, and at the same time, love isn't about martyrdom or enabling dysfunction, but there needs to be conversation. And in that conversation, there's hard choices and deferment in love to the spouse. Here's the key. I believe we need to design our lifestyle that allows you to invest in others. And what you will find in a marriage relationship, it's not about losing yourself, but it's about becoming your best self by deciding not to make everything about yourself. And there's freedom in that. What I've found in counseling and, and here at the church is that a lot of times the longer a marriage relationship goes on, the easier it is to make it more about you, which is what Paul is drilling down on. It's about what you want. It's about what you deserve. It's about what they're not doing and what they should do. And what happens is this thing that started off with you being enamored and infatuated and in love and be willing to do anything for them and having your whole life revolve around that individual turns into something that they're not doing for you. And some of us end up turning into someone we never wanted to be. And we're in a relationship, and all of a sudden, we're a person who always has to insist their way. We turn into a person that's hounding about what they need to improve. And what I see in a lot of couples is that one side or the other side ends up demanding way more than they're willing to invest. 
And here's the relational equity, is that you withdraw when you continue to withdraw more than you deposit, you end up getting into relational bankruptcy. It's the principle that at the beginning we laughed at Ray for, for not understanding finances. It's the same principle that many of us hasn't, haven't relearned as relationships as adults. Like if, if you swipe the card and you haven't put anything into the account, I mean, are you going to walk away disappointed? And so here, I got to thinking, how can I show Jessica I'm willing to lay down what I want for the sake of what she wants? How can I do that more often in our marriage? Let me give you just some practical ways. And I know we've got a lot of practical subpoints, but but just hang with me. Some practical ways to maybe deposit back into an empty account. Very simply, pay attention. Pay attention. Take notice how they act and then respond to what your spouse may need. Sometimes we, when we're cohabitating or just kind of going through the motions, we miss a lot of signals. Anybody like had the conversation ever? You're kind of quiet. I've been quiet for five days. Thanks for not noticing. Anybody ever done the? (sighs) 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 Have an asthma attack? No, I'm mad. I'm frustrated. Some things are going on. Like, like, do we notice? Do we notice? facial expressions, shoulders, the way we carry ourselves, and are we engaging and paying attention to our partner? Do we notice and respond to what they may need? Next, invite them to share. Again, this is that dialogue daily. It's so important. Give 20 to 30 minutes of undivided attention without the phone. Listen to stuff happening in their life without you responding to your life. Get the whole story. Even the stuff on the outside of relationships. Uh, again, I'll get in counseling with a couple and they're like, ah, oh, he starts talking about computers and I don't know anything he's talking about. Learn. Be intentional. Get in the world. She's talking about this and I really don't care about this. Start caring. Start deferring your needs. Have conversation. Because how many of you know in relationships they start to collapse when outside stress starts to spill into the relationship? And what happens, that stress is felt, but we're not talking about it. We're not sharing. Invite them to share. Number three, show gratitude daily. I know generationally sometimes there's a gap with this word called affirmation, appreciation, or love. Man, we're built and we're wired for affirmation, to share, hey, you are amazing at this. I appreciate you for doing this. I've seen you do that, and I'm so thankful that you did that. And just sharing those and noticing those things will go a long way in that emotional bank account. And the last one, to deposit in the emotional bank account, be touchy-feely. You ready, student section? Be touchy-feely, parents. Be touchy-feely. I know you don't wanna hear that, but statistics show that couples that kiss and hug and hold hands and cuddle and gently touch each other in passing, the reports show they have a significantly better sex life than those who don't. That was a word for somebody. Hold hands again, touch again. I will tell you, although it is gross to your kids, it is the greatest godly example that they can see parents who are attracted to each other. That they see you hugging your spouse, that they see you loving on your spouse. And not just always sexually, but sometimes sexually, it's even good. Sorry kids, I can't keep my hands off your mom. I say that out loud and they say gross, but I want them to know that I'm madly in love with my spouse. I want them to know that she is the the love of my life and of my heart. And I'm setting that example and I'm showing that. We'll hug in the kitchen and my eight-year-old daughter, she just lights up and she'll come in. She's like, I need a a sandwich. Get it? We're setting that model. Be touchy-feely. If you need more of that, go back to week one. 
See, I get that all of these things might be uncomfortable, but I will tell you that's kind of the point. That if you want a long lasting relationship and be in it for the long haul, you're gonna have to elevate caring for them instead of being comfortable. I mean, a love is costly. And so I got to thinking, after all of this message, and even this last point, where, where do I start? Which one is the most important? And two, two questions, and I, I want you to write this down. Don't use my wife's name, use your own. But what if I made the habit of asking, Jessica, how can I make your life easier today? I wanna serve you. I wanna, I wanna serve you above, above me. In transparency, I will tell you sometimes, sometimes when I have that hard day, anybody, you know, you have the hard day or the long day, and really it was just a little bit stressful or whatever, we wanna come in and we wanna immediately announce that, right? Oh man, this day was so difficult. Oh, I just need to sit down for a minute. I need to just get on my phone and look at the 47 text messages. Because why? Ultimately, selfishly, I want, I want me time. I want to veg. I want to do what I want to do in that moment. And what if I could flip the script? Hey, babe, what can I do for you? Where have you been at today? What are things going on today? And we move, we move in that moment. I mean, you know, time goes by quick. Life goes by fast. We move in that moment. What if we could, what could I do to make your life easier today? And number two, what if I made the commitment to outserve Jessica with no strings attached. I'm gonna, I'm gonna outserve you. Whatever it is, I'm, I'm here. I'm putting my hands to it. You need something done, I'm here. I don't go to the grocery store. Get over yourself. Go there, do stuff, lot, help, do things, do things around the house, help each other, wives, help the husband. What are we doing? Serve. What if we made the commitment to outserve each other? Why? Healthy marriages work. They give and they serve, and they serve. As we close, I know I went a little longer this morning. As we close, I will tell you the enemy is at war for your marriage. He wants you dysfunctional. He wants you cohabitating. He wants you just not even concerned with the other. He wants you living day to day. One of the best things that Pastor Adam said was that passage in Corinthians. He doesn't want you to have healthy sex life. He wants to destroy and to kill your marriage. He wants to do that. And so here's, here's the catch, that if his desire is for me to live childlike, to make it all about me, how can I change? How can I move? How can I get aligned with Ephesians chapter five? I'm gonna challenge you. Commit to these four Ds. So I mean, this afternoon, after you have sexy nap time, you need to get out your calendar. I just threw that plug in. <laughs> you need to get out your calendar. All right, where's our date this week? When we go on that date, we're gonna do something crazy. We're gonna plan to depart this quarter before Christmas. We're gonna get away, just the two of us. I know babysitters and I know the things and maybe we can ask the in-laws to come in and do something crazy. But we're gonna make a commitment, even if it's one night in downtown Charleston, we're gonna commit. We're gonna commit to get away. We're gonna commit to dial. And you're gonna start this process. Commit to the four Ds. The next thing, commit to do what is loving most to your partner. I'm just gonna speak your love language. I'm gonna do what's loving most. And if you don't know what's loving most, ask, have conversations. I'm gonna commit. And then the third thing, how can I serve you? How can I serve you? When I come home from work, when we come home from work, when you're at your work and I'm at my work and we come, how can we serve? How can we serve each other? Bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Maybe you're in here today and you say, hey, Pastor Jason, my marriage relationship is rough right now. We're living on separate pages, kind of even living in separate lives. Maybe there's some hurt from some past mistakes and some things that you've walked to. Maybe there's baggage from previous relationships that you've been in. Or maybe it's just 
you've been at this for a while, kids and things and life, and you kind of just quit trying and you're cohabitating. Lord spoke this to me this morning, and I wanna share with you that I believe that this morning can be a recommitment, that this morning can be a rededication, that this morning can be a renewal of that first love, of that dating relationship. How many thankful that we have a Holy Spirit who refreshes, renews, and restores? That's what he does, and he's here today. I'm thankful for the beautiful picture of Ephesians chapter five. This is how Christ loved the church. This is ought to be how we love in our marriage. Father, today I thank you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're here. But I know that some are in relationships or struggling. There, there may be somebody in here whose spouse doesn't know you or serve you or, or is not here today. God, there, there's a heaviness that comes with this marriage, as we, this, this message as we talk about marriage. There's a weight that's around this. And so Father, today I pray that you would be the lifter of our head today. Father, today I pray that you would renew a sense of urgency in us. God, many of us have been, we've just been behaving for ourselves. We have that childish mindset. Father, today I pray that there would be a challenge to grow up, to grow up in your word, to grow up in what you've called us to do. That God, you've designed us to live and to give to others. And so let that be our heart's cry today.